Thank you. My name is uh, Youssef Munayer. I'd like to thank uh, Tom and, and Omar and the Middle East Policy Council for the opportunity to address you today and for convening this important panel. We find ourselves today, 20 years since the Oslo Accords, in a position where many still advocate for two states. And two states, in fact, is the stated policy objective of this country's government. While in reality, we have never been further from two states on the ground. It's time to wake up. What we have today is a one-state reality. The one-state versus two-state debate is not so much a debate about which solution is better at all. To have a debate about which solution is more appropriate, there must first be an agreement about what the problem is we are seeking to solve. Increasingly, the two-state, one-state divide is characterized by an overlapping divide in an understanding of the problem. Two-state proponents see the problem as demographic, leading to the conclusion that drawing a line can solve it. One-state proponents tend to see the problem as one of rights denied, which can only be corrected by fully affording those rights. In my view, the problem has never been about finding space for two nationalisms in one geography, but rather, about the basic rights denied to the native inhabitants of that geography for the purpose of empowering just one particular demography. The foundations of Zionism, wrote the prolific and brilliant critic Hannah Arendt in the 1940s, were laid during a time when nobody could imagine any solution of minority or nationality problems other than the autonomous national state with a homogeneous population. Zionists, she said, are afraid the whole building might crack if they abandon their old ideas. The contrary is true, she says, the building will collapse if we don't adapt our minds and our ideas to new facts and new developments. The interesting question to me is not one state or two. It's clear that the answer is the former. Rather, the interesting question to me, and one that we should all be asking, is why? Why, despite stated policy naming two states as the objective, and despite growing policy advocacy in favor of that objective, are we further from that objective in reality today than ever? The answer, I believe, is even though the truth is blindingly obvious, it's inconvenient for many, especially politically. This forces two-state proponents to formulate advocacy based less on the landscape on the ground and more on the landscape of argumentation. More often than not, this means behaving reactively and operating in the little space left available for dissent in an overwhelmingly Zionist discourse in Washington and more broadly in the United States. This approach is problematic, to say the least, and leads to the promulgation of several myths. These myths end up creating expectations that are never fulfilled. One state or two, we must correct this method of advocacy or continue to watch it falter. Allow me to enumerate the three most problematic myths. Myth number one, Middle East peace and the creation of a Palestinian state is a, quote, vital national security interest of the United States. I can't tell you how many times I've heard this especially from those dedicated to two-state advocacy. This became something of a battle cry after 9-11, the logic being that the blowback from prolonged U.S. support for Israel at the expense of Palestinians will cost the United States. This much is true. Palestine is the bleeding heart of the Arab world and the cause of discontent among many across state borders. But a vital national security interest? That's beyond a stretch. Let's define this for a moment. A vital national security interest is, in plain terms, an interest the United States would use military force to defend. Seeing that the United States will not so much as condition aid to Israel in an effort to change its colonial behavior in the West Bank, I think it's safe to say that there is nothing vital about this interest. The United States' vital interests in the region are straightforward. It cares about maintaining Israel as an ally in the region and propping up other allied regimes. The overarching goal in the region has always been the same, ensuring stability to facilitate the free flow of natural resources out of the region. Now, Palestine can be connected to this, 
There's no doubt that the prolonged statelessness of Palestinians has had destabilizing effects on the region <clears throat> that nearly even brought the United States to war. In Jordan in the fall of 1970, the United States was only a few Syrian tanks away from what could have been military confrontation with the Soviet Union. But much has changed since then. The instability of Palestinian statelessness has largely been contained to the occupied territories, thanks to an abomination known as the Oslo Accords, which imploded a problematic PLO into an even more problematic Palestinian authority, and, of course, thanks to steadfast Israeli repression. So the question of Palestine is far from being a vital national security interest for the United States. That being said, a peace agreement could serve U.S. interests in the region, insofar as it contributes to regional stability. But this is a secondary, if not tertiary, objective. This means that while it might serve U.S. interests, crafting policy to achieve it involves a calculus that gives great deference to other interests, including domestic political co constraints, which are strongly opposed to this end. This brings us then to myth number two. Myth number two. Ending the occupation is in Israel's interest. This, too, is a popular mantra of two-state advocacy, the idea being that Israel, an ostensible Jewish and democratic state, cannot subjugate millions of voiceless Palestinians without an identity crisis. But this dangerously conflates the interests of the state with the interests of maintaining this identity. Israel's claim to Jewish democracy and Israel's interests are two very different things. This much is evidenced by the fact that a growing number of Israelis are perfectly willing to jettison the notion of democracy in favor of demographic supremacy and keeping the majority of the settlements. So what interests are involved in the occupation, and perhaps more importantly, what interests weigh into the decision to end the occupation? Israel today is a strong state with a thriving economy. True, it is increasingly isolated in the world, but few Israelis seem to genuinely care. Hundreds of thousands of Israelis, about 10% of the population, live in occupied territory. These folks vote, and they vote in growing numbers. In a study I did on Israeli election data from 2009 and 2013, the most recent election, the most striking thing I found was when you disaggregate settlement voters and non-settlement voters, what you find is over a four-year period, there was a 6.2% increase in the number of eligible voters outside the settlements, whereas inside the settlements, that increase was a remarkable 45% over four years. This is due in part to state policies of settlement expansion and financial incentives encouraging the transfer of civilians to the settlements, but also due to the stark disparity in birth rates between the settlements and those not in the settlements. Couple this with the fact that while turnout in the main population centers outside the settlements, like Tel Aviv, for example, was about 62%, turnout in the settlements was 78%. Then throw into the mix the fact that most Israelis that did not vote for Likud or uh, the religious nationalist parties are more concerned about the price of cottage cheese than some abstract notion of identity, and you can clearly see why Israeli settlers and their interests are overrepresented in the decision-making officialdom in Israel and will continue to be into the future. But these are just the political costs. There are other costs associated with Israel making the decision to end the occupation. Some naively argue that since Israeli settlements exist by virtue of the Israeli military's defense of them, if the Israeli military withdrew, the settlers would quickly leave. But as we saw in Gaza, there is nothing simple or cheap about this exercise. Aside from the need to use military force to evacuate the settlements in Gaza, the resettlement costs of about 5,000 Israeli settlers, many of whom, by the way, resettled in the occupied West Bank, cost about one billion U.S. dollars. Think then about 20 times this number. That number, about 100,000, is a conservative estimate of the number of settlers that would have to be removed in a very unfavorable land swap deal for the Palestinians. This is not Yamit we're talking about here. But let us, for the sake of argument, think about that number. Based on resettlement costs from the 2005 withdrawal, which is, by the way, in 2005 dollars, this would cost about 10% of Israel's current GDP. Add to this the additional value Israel gains from the occupation, including the exploitation of the land and resources, 
prime among which, of course, is precious water. Israel illegally takes some 80% of the mountain aquifer's water, which is located in the West Bank. That water is a significant portion of the state's supply, 60% of which is devoted to domestic agriculture. In the last few days, the World Bank released an important and detailed report on the impact of Area C closures on the Palestinian economy. What was clear was that in Area C, Palestinians are losing out on billions of dollars in potential economic rewards from the land, the water, the mineral resources, tourism, and so on. What is not explicitly stated, but is nonetheless clear, is who is reaping these economic rewards in the meantime? The State of Israel. Some will concede that Israel reaps many rewards from the occupation, but note that there are also costs to a prolonged military presence in the West Bank. Surely there are. But those costs have only become more and more bearable under the two-state framework and its peace process. In fact, Israeli defense consumption in relation to its GDP is, in recent years, at record lows. Over the course of the past 20 years, that number has halved. So while there are military costs associated with the occupation, they have only declined and continue to decline during peace processing, while the rewards of occupation and the costs of withdrawal have only increased in large part thanks to the same process. If we're going to talk about Israel's interests vis-a-vis -vis the occupation, let's talk about real, cold, hard interests, not abstract interests. It's only the former that actually influences state behavior. This brings us then to myth number three. Myth number three, the status quo is unsustainable. It's said that a lie told often enough becomes truth. I don't know if that's the case, but I do know that a lie told often enough might be repeated by the president and other principles of his administration. Indeed, in 2011, President Obama said about Israel, quote, precisely because of our friendship, it is important that we tell the truth. The status quo is unsustainable. The dream of a Jewish and democratic state cannot be fulfilled with permanent occupation. The same was uttered by his then Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton. If anything has been sustainable in the turbulent Middle East for the last half century, longer than Mubarak and longer than Gaddafi, it has been Israel's occupation. Sure, nothing is sustainable forever. At one point, I suppose the Grand Canyon was just a river but it's particularly disingenuous to hear this language from the very officials who are crafting policy to ensure that the status quo remains sustainable. As I've already discussed, not only is the Israeli occupation sustainable, it is profitable. Indeed, Israel has done almost all it can to ensure the occupation persists for generations by carving up the West Bank with colonies and entrenching its presence there. Washington has done little to stop it and is, in fact, actively encouraging it with economic and diplomatic support. There was a time only 20 years ago when a U.S. Secretary of State was rallying international support to get behind a U.N. Security Council resolution condemning Israeli settlements as illegal. Not illegitimate, but illegal. Today, it is the United States that is single-handedly standing in the way of such a resolution by using its veto despite vast international support for it. The status quo is absolutely sustainable in large part because of Washington's unyielding support for Israel. Telling ourselves otherwise, despite this obvious reality, is a recipe for disappointment and disillusionment. Why is it so important to debunk these myths? By allowing these myths to be our assumptions, we permit unrealistic expectations to come about. If for, a, if, for example, a peace deal was a vital national security interest of the United States, and if ending the occupation was in Israel's interest, and if there was an urgency created by an unsustainable status quo, well, then you'd expect all that is necessary is to bring the parties together to the negotiating table for a ripe deal to be made. If power acts in its interest, and with these assumptions we'd think that would be the case, the negotiations should lead to the desired outcome. Instead, as we have seen, negotiations have only led to the opposite outcome. In fact, it is due to the illusions these myths create that many can't see the blatant double standard so perfectly captured by President Obama himself in recent weeks. It was just last week that President Obama told NPR in regard to the stance House Republicans were taking by refusing to pass a continuing resolution before a government shutdown deadline, quote, 
You don't negotiate by putting a gun to the other person's head. And yet, only days earlier, President Obama said, after meeting with Mahmoud Abbas on the sidelines of the UNGA, that negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians it occupies, not merely with a gun to their head, but with an entire foreign military occupation in their land, negotiations were, quote, the best way, the only way for a successful outcome. These myths and assumptions also lead to an unrealistic and unhelpful understanding of responsibility and blame. If it's good for the United States and good for Israel, why hasn't it happened, we are led to believe? It must be because of Palestinian rejectionism. Moving forward, we need to revisit these assumptions, challenge these myths, and radically alter policy if there's going to be a change in the situation. Here's what most liberal Zionist two-state advocates and what most other two-state advocates constrained by U.S. domestic politics don't want to tell you or are afraid to tell you. Without massive, and I underscore massive, pressure on Israel, Israel has no reason to change the status quo. Advocacy for a two-state outcome without advocacy for massive pressure on Israel to bring it at minimum into full compliance with international law is, in effect, advocacy for perpetual occupation, and is in part responsible for the morass of today. All of this brings us back to the more fundamental question. Should policy advocacy aim for what is right, fair, and just, or should it aim for the path of least resistance given the powers that be? I don't know where the United States might be if Martin Luther King chose the latter. I don't know where South Africa might be if Mandela chose the latter. I do know, however, where Israel-Palestine would be if advocates continue to choose the latter, precisely where we are today, but with more settlers and an even deeper-rooted version of Israeli apartheid. It's time, as Hannah Arendt said, to adapt our minds and our ideas to the present reality and imagine new paths forward. Thank you. Introduce yourself. Introduce yourself.